Thank you for your great uh, words. Uh, uh, I just have, just if I understand. So, um, so if the West Coast was slaves sent to Brazil, and then they were under Brazilian slave owners, and then they come back and they have uh, a Brazilian name, and then they'll come back, come out back again. What's so fascinating is, it seems like these came back with an incredible entrepreneurial spirit, um, and how that came about, because they probably didn't come back with a lot of money, but how they managed to come back and with such a different perspective and build such a new history. Also, how about how many people do you think estimated came back? I was looking at the numbers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because uh, I think they said it took uh, 3,000, 5,000. There are different, uh, there are different uh, uh, numbers uh, around this kind of impact. Uh, uh, but yeah, quite a sufficient number to have such an uh, impact, visible, uh, visible impact. And what is interesting, it makes you think about as well. Uh, slavery uh, in Brazil, because the first question is thinking about how come they managed to buy their freedom. Obviously, it wasn't the majority, which is like was really difficult. But also, they were from the city, and uh, an interesting element is that they weren't necessarily working for a master in the plantation or in the master house. There were some of them when they were they had their own house because people were hiring those slaves because they were carpenters, so they had their own house, their own well, house. More place where they were living, and so when people needed carpenters, they needed bassoon, those people were coming, and uh, they were uh, working. So that's it. It shows also that there was a big uh, uh, community uh, of uh, working, if you want, slaves uh, in at uh, uh, that time, and uh, also uh, that's why I mentioned like in Brazil, like like houses. Building have built have been built by slaves. You have a uh, uh, Mestre Valentin, which is known to have uh, uh, or uh, Ale Jardino, who is known to have uh, in the in um, Ouro Preto, in one of the city in Brazil, to his uh, his mixed race. It was uh, uh, and he actually uh, his uh, sculptures are well known in Brazil. And you see even in the sculpture that the figures are uh, like. Has uh, like African features, so that's what we don't think about. Is like the culture is different. It also the uh, the the Afro Brazilian as well had an impact on the culture in Brazil. So that's why they were able to bring back the, the culture into uh, into uh, West Africa. And they always because they had to find a a trade to be able to have the money to build these buildings. Yeah. That's quite fascinating. Yeah, they had to be to, uh, to but they, 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 they asked for help. Like there was a letter, I was reading a letter where they asked help for uh, uh, the authorities uh, uh, in uh, Lagos to help them settle. Uh, you had a figure that I forgot to mention, the Shasha de Sunda, uh, which is a bit of ambiguous figure because we don't know where exactly where it's from. He's Portuguese. He's claiming like African ancestry, but uh, we don't know his portrait. Like sometimes it's you know, black, sometimes it's not. So like we don't really know. But he's uh, like Brazilian, uh, and he uh, did some trading in uh, in the Bight of Benin, and he was quite. It, it was really crucial in the settling of those communities as well. He encouraged them to come to settle in uh, some yeah. different. Yeah. He's, uh, just to add to your question, the wave of Brazilian descendants didn't come en masse, so they came in different yeah. stages as well. So I think, you know, because when I was young, you know, I used to think mass migration, um, because that was just really Brittany's, you know. So you think, oh my God, it's the caravan people coming in, you know, um, descending in Lagos. But there was also a lot of correspondence between the Brazilian, the families in Lagos and Brazil as well. Um, we had the second Black African Festac, the Festival of Arts and Culture in 1977. And um, a lot of the Brazilian, return, um, um, a lot of the families, you know, also actually returned to Lagos. 
for the festival. So families who still corresponded. I have a lot of families that are Sonsao and now they're Alakijas. So a lot of them also changed their names back to the Yoruba names as well. So you have loads of families who, so when I was also doing my, well, this interviews, you know, we also have to remember that not all of the um, African Brazilians in Lagos, you know, would necessarily have Brazilian names. Some of them had changed their names. So my really close friends, you know, um, who are the Alakijas, um, I'm hoping they don't mind me, but anyway, I'm going to interview them and I told them, um, they still have family in Brazil and they still live as themselves. The Marino family also have family in Brazil. So you still have a few, there's still correspondence, you know, um, between, so when the Brazil, African Brazilians came to Lagos, um, you also had people who were already there on the ground. You know, it's like, you know, if you move to a new city and you have a friend or family, you know, you also have that community as well. Um, so that way people were already there and they would send for other people to come. So that's how people already settled. Then they have families coming in who were already there and then they would settle. And was told um, by another friend um, whose grandmother, um, great-grandmother, um, was the one responsible for settling um, the um, Britannies on Lagos Island. So I'm trying to interview that family as well, because the stories, you know, are so passed on from different families. When I was interviewing in Lagos in February, um, God, it seems like this year, I was going to say last year, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, early February this year, um, we had a specific quest set of questions that we were going to ask people so that we could just see the spread. It became very repetitive because I went to somebody and they were telling me something and went somewhere else. So you could see this recurring theme, which is actually quite interesting because I thought, well, you know, the first time we've heard some of the, the local language because they're like some of the words, you know, um, that still are still in the community, you know, um, things like abensi, abensi ya means peace be unto you. And my mother would say that, but never my grandmother would say abensi, and like, what's that? We interviewed um, Professor Yusuf Grillo, who is also of Brazilian descent, and he is um, also um, Muslim as well. Um, Yusuf Cameron Grillo. So Yusuf and a Brazilian name and um, an English name, Yusuf. Um, one of the um, greatest artists in Nigeria. I was privileged to um, actually speak to him. Now the irony was um, we had requested to speak to him because of his age, you know, he's getting on. So I had to get my aunt who had studied on the him as well um, to kind of uh, broker an interview. And um, when we got there, he told us, and this is quite interesting, he said, oh, you are the second group of Brazilians and people coming in today to come and speak to me. So apparently, the, the, another group from Brazil had come, you know, a couple of days before we did. And he, apparently, he was a bit exhausted. He didn't want to talk to us because he was exhausted uh, because they brought lights, camera, and film. So, which is what I am very upset about, that um, there is more interest from outside, which we don't know about. Because a lot of people, they, because we don't have a national archive, so anyone who's doing research on Brazil will have to contact families on their own and you know, speak to them. And the families are quite happy to speak to those people. So what they're doing is they're actually taking that knowledge. It's knowledge. Because I'm, I'll say, because I'm writing a doctoral thesis here at the University of London. And for me to actually get the archive of Nigeria, my PhD was not funded. And obviously born in the UK, but yet I pay home fees and it's still not, you know. But what I'm saying is that to get into the archives, 
information is, is key. We still have to pay. So Professor Yusuf Grino was telling us that he had people from Brazil that come in with us, you know, and they were there for almost 64 hours interviewing him. And you know, he's in his, he's getting on. So by the time we crawled in, he was probably like, oh no, you know. But the good thing about what we found out was when we started questioning him about his childhood in the, you know, Lagos Island and um, the um, culture and, you know, the questions, he just started speaking, you know, he just lit up because the memory just came back again. We thought we were going to be there for an hour because my aunt is sitting there and she was giving us the look like, hurry up and let's go, you know. And all of a sudden, he turned it on us, you know, when we were able to sit and talk to him. Um, we were fortunate, you know, but um, my aunt as well, who is um, Dos Santos, um, she told me that her mother was interviewed in the late 60s as well by some researchers from Brazil. So somewhere in Brazil, there are archives of our own history, you know, um, in, the, in the National Archives, but we don't even have the history. So what we're trying to do now is to preserve. Whatever recordings we do will be deposited at the University of Libanon, um, University of Lagos, and the National Archives in Abuja. So we're keeping the history in Lagos, and then we'll also have the online as well. But that history has to be preserved. Can, can't you try to com, com, communicate with the ones in Brazil and bring some? Sorry. Can't you communicate with the ones and try to find out who yeah, they are? Yeah, we are, because yeah. I mean, yeah, we have to. Yeah. But I, I think it's more to do with, because when I did my research, I had much more, uh, I was just lucky that I could navigate with different uh, I had much more uh, um, literature here from Brazil, and it's understandable because we're talking about, I've talked about the slave rebellion, the Mali revolt, which was important for, for Brazil, so it explained the, the returns movement, but also from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from Benin. So when I was actually looking, for me it was easier, that was the, one of the issues, is like I had more material to talk about what was happening in Benin than in Nigeria, so I think it comes also from the fact that like, if I speak to a, uh, a person in Benin and say, oh, I'm doing my research on the Aguda, they will know we are the Aguda. If I'm saying some, something like that to someone from Nigeria, they're not always known, un unless they are from family. So I think it, it was more, and because again, I would say that, uh, for example, it's not necessarily in the archive, but it's like, we have, uh, I've spoken about him, Pierre Berger, that did a lot of work around it, and you have a foundation in Brazil. So, they always think about, like especially among the afro brazilian community, they always think about the link with uh, Africa. It's always been there, so that's why you have this uh, this uh, literature. And I and I and I and I had to face that when I was looking. It was really uh, difficult. It was mentioned by architects uh, in Nigeria and some Africa because they were it was fun, but it was little compared to all the work I've seen from uh, writers or historians from. In terms of uh, memory, because uh, this is also an important part of your research, um, how much were you able, or historians have been able, to trace back the retention of, because uh, from, um, what's his name again, Baba Sudenawa and uh, John Truer, mm -hmm. they've established that most of the uh, former people who were taken from uh, Yoruba land to, uh, uh, to Nigeria, to, to Brazil, and to some extent Cuba, came from the, uh, the western part of Yoruba land, the Kebe people, those who actually developed the Kebe de Masquerade, mm -hmm. because they found also uh, some, uh, uh, some old artifacts. How much were they able to, the former Brazilian, while they actually started to learn uh, the western technique to build houses? bring those elements or reference to uh, the, the either mask or uh, uh, the, that tradition culture to the new building? That's the first question. In, 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 uh, yeah. in, in Brazil, when they start to develop that, and when they move back to Nigeria, the question I have is, 
uh, apparently in Cuba up to 1940, people could still speak Yoruba or Ikongo. When the first influx of people moved back from Brazil to Cuba, uh, not from Brazil to Nigeria, you know, the Abuda, when they first moved back, were they still able to speak Yoruba? And secondly, when they practiced, you know, obviously that syncretism, the something and all that, something else, Cuba, Candomblé in Brazil, when they moved back to uh, Nigeria, were they still practicing Candomblé? And also when they came back, because they had a special guild as a builder, is it possible also to build almost a parallelism with Freemasonry, with special trade, and it became a special caste, a special guild? So it sounds like the first question was about like if there is same some uh, in, that, in the view in the in the buildings. Um, I think as I've mentioned, there are some um, there are not necessarily from the north of Brazil, but like uh, some known uh, uh, builders, uh, like I, I say. Um, like Alex Jardinus, that in their sculpture they've been influenced by, they have carried in the churches. Uh, if when I when I was in Brazil, what I found was really clear the syncretism uh, in the like the church I've shown you, uh, Nossa uh, Senhora do Rosário dos Pretos, uh, was really interesting because uh, at the same time it's a church, a big church. But they are practicing ceremonies. Uh, so when I went there, they had like a, like a ceremony inside the, the church. So they've always been, um, because it's not that Senora Rosario dos Pretos. So for the uh, Pretos is black people. So it was aimed at the, uh, at, the, uh, at the black people. So there is, like, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, architecture, there were, yes, elements uh, retained. When they went back to Nigeria, that's a question. That's still a question mark because they were also influenced by uh, the, the 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 region. So that's why it's not the that's a difficulty to. There've been different artists doing that try to define the style, and uh, they see that it changes according to the to the region. So some Yoruba elements were implemented into the uh, Brazilian building, but they were implemented because they were influenced by the other buildings, so not necessarily because they were uh, from uh, Yoruba, African returns. So we not, we're not always, um, at least I'm not all, uh, always uh, sure. And I have the feeling that while they were in Brazil, they, they are certain their African origin, but when they went back, they are certain their Brazilian, yes. Brazilian-ness, which often does not happen. So, uh, and then the third question, which was? Then again, it's uh, because the more I was looking into it, the more I found that it was really a complex group to define. Because some of them, there is a uh, there is a really good uh, article it's called uh, uh, Aguda and Jaguda, and he was made the distinction between the Aguda that were working in the colonial power that were actually uh, um, close to them, and then the one that actually. Uh, were opposing, so you have like they were really uh, they were heterogeneous group, and so really a different. So it's difficult. Uh, I have to do more research about that to, to, to define because you, I just feel like if I make a statement, I'm generalizing a group that is actually quite uh, diverse. They were, I think, there is an element of that that they were pretty special community because they marry between themselves, they keep between themselves. That's why you still have those things, but but at the same time, I think it's difficult to, uh, to make a statement. We've got to take one more question, but sadly we have to... Uh... Good evening, Hennessy. My name is Rosalind Patrick. I noticed that you had some questions in your, in your presentation. I don't actually have a question because I'm just like people, I'm also a person at the center. I 
for Portuguese. At some point in time, the society became engineered. So we were Anglophones. We were Anglophiles, we spoke English, we dressed English. Initially, those who came as returnees actually dressed Portuguese. Mm -hmm. I did the secretary of the Brazilian Descendants Association. So we have events where you see people all dressed up in their outfits. But they are only brought out now as, as um, ceremonial costumes. At that time, it was a daily way of life. It was a daily dress. So that was where the artisanship was lost. It was no longer involved to build those houses in Brazilian style. So houses were being built in English style. And I think because of the silence of the community in itself, we didn't speak up for ourselves. We didn't preserve enough. But then you also have the greater Nigerian attitude. We don't preserve old things. I don't know if it's called a kind of gerontophobia. We like new things a lot. So our museums are not as buoyant as they should be. A lot of old houses are being knocked down because people don't look at it as a cultural advantage. They look at it as a financial advantage to build a bigger house to rent out to tenants. They don't look at it as a cultural or tourism deal. So, sorry, can I just interject? Um, in my generation, and sorry, when I say to people I'm actually doing a PhD in history, I've not been supported by Nigeria at all. It's why I choose I'm from West Africa. I'm only now going back to Nigeria as an authority, actually putting them to question and saying, we've got to do it now. That's really where we are right now on the story. Nigeria has always had a capitalist attitude, where the French have always preserved. My work is on the first French, first African filmmaker, first African filmmaker from Francophone West Africa, Usman Sembe. If you Google him, his name is right up there. He may have had problems with the Senegalese government, but preservation of his work is still absolute because they preserve. If we have Nigerians over here, those of you from the African Brazilian community, please support the Nigerian Brazilian project. We've tried to speak to people in Lagos. I've been given, you know, um, people are not speaking. So we say, well, that's fine. Those of you who want to preserve your history, you know where you come to. I'm not making a political statement here. But all I'm just saying is that as an academic, as a historian, I'm not making any money from this. We just want to preserve that history because it's all part of the national as well. And Brazil, they also want to complete that story as well. We have people in Bahia who we can go into Bahia, it's not a problem. They're willing to speak to us. It's that conversation between Lagos and Brazil, not Brazil and Lagos is very important at the moment. Thank you so much, Alinta. I've worked with Alinta for years. Um, we did the Lagos um, to London project as well, which is why um, I com commend her for actually working on this absolute complex work. It's so complex, but thank you so much, Alinta. Merci beaucoup. Um, je vous, um, she was sweat. Merci. Because she's also from Francophone, West Africa as well. Merci, Bia. Merci. Thank you very much all for your commitment. And usually we have a little tradition because we have to round up. And usually what we do, we go to the pub across the street where we have an informal conversation uh, because uh, we have a lot to share. And I would like to thank everyone who committed uh, to uh, this talk. I would like to thank Anita actually for her dedication <laughs> and research. And to André for her eloquence and also being a cultural ambassador because we need that uh, to push him forward. Sadly, I didn't pick your name, but we Sorry, also need Rosalind, yeah. Rosalind yeah. and uh, it will, what I like about uh, this informal talk. Uh, is um, that uh, I heard you actually discussing and I found it as exciting as well. <laughs> <laughs> and we need to have uh, more of this conversation. So uh, once again, everyone, thank you very much. And you need also, uh, you deserve a, a big round of applause. Thank you very much. And see you next time.
time. Thank you.